was, well, I'll come back to that. Um, okay, let's get started. Let's get started. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for coming to spend your Tuesday afternoon with us. Um, I want to talk today about uh, simple population models of epidemics. And the topics are going to be essentially how do we model the spread of virus in the community? Uh, very simple models of that. We're going to get started with that. Uh, we're going to be dealing with what are called uh, SI models. Those are susceptible infected models. Uh, and uh, SIR models, susceptible infected. And the usual word is recovered, but it really means resistant models. Uh, we can do quite a bit with those, although we won't get through a lot of it today. And we'll use that to introduce some simple uh, Python and Tellurium uh, concepts that we'll use repeatedly later on. Next week, we'll extend these models just a little bit, and then we'll actually try fitting them to some real experimental data. Josh has been hard at work uh, developing that, uh, and we'll have that for you for next week. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, people who are concerned about homework, don't worry too much about making the homework pretty. Uh, anything that's readable is fine. Um, if there are things that have to be written out like equations and it's too much trouble to typeset them, you're welcome to write them on a piece of paper and uh, take a shot of it with your cell phone and, and send that as a PDF. Uh, I don't want you spending a lot of time. I do want you thinking, and I, I do want to be able to understand what you're thinking, uh, but I want you to spend your time as much as possible thinking about the problems and the presentation is nice, but that shouldn't be uh, the most important thing. Um, we're going to go through a bunch of uh, exercises in class this today more than last week, and this will be typical. Um, depending on how much time we have and how things go, those exercises may be more or less open-ended. And so the homework problems may include exercises we've already done in class. That's an opportunity for you to drill in a little more deeply if there are things to do. But if you completed the exercise in, home, in, the, in the class, uh, there's no point in repeating it uh, in the homework. So sometimes the homework will be an extension of an exercise, so, but, and the exercise will be written out in full in the homework assignment as a reminder, so you don't have to look into the slide deck for it. Uh, but if you've already done it, you can simply say you did it in class. You don't have to repeat it. If there's a result from the class that you want to cite, that's great. Uh, but don't don't feel that you have to do everything a second time because it shows up in homework text. Okay. So I thought it might actually be helpful given that uh, we really don't get to see each other so much. If we could just go around the room maybe and just spend two or three minutes introducing ourselves. You don't have to. Uh, but uh, if you're willing to spend a minute introducing yourself in your background, you did that in your in your uh, questionnaire that was very helpful to me. But for your classmates, and it might be useful as well. I think you're all able to unmute yourselves. So, Josh, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I'm Joshua. I'm a, um, I am a PhD student in James Glacier's lab. Uh, I am in ISC, this is my fourth year now. Um, I am interested in um, computational modeling, both of um, infectious diseases, cancer, and uh, both in uh, as ODEs, which is what we do here, but also, and more importantly, in spatial context, uh, which is what we do in the second part of this uh, course. Okay, so I guess I, I talked a little bit about myself last time. I'm, I'm a professor in intelligent systems engineering. Uh, my PhD work, my undergraduate work is actually in mathematics and physics. My PhD was in experimental physics. I retrained as an experimental biologist after my PhD and worked in experimental neuroscience and developmental biology for many years got more and more interested in computational understanding of those things. Um, 
and uh, I spend some of my time developing software tools like actually Tellurium I don't have anything to do with but CompuCell which uh, the second semester uses and then a lot more of my time building computational models of particular systems whether those are normal systems like developmental biology or disease systems and I'm particularly interested these days in trying to come up with approaches to improve therapies. And so I'm very interested in building computer simulations, so-called virtual twins, that will allow us to improve uh, personalized medicine and uh, therapy options for people. Uh, Tyler, do you want to say, introduce yourself then? Yeah, uh, my name's Tyler. I'm a junior in ISE and studying and doing a concentration in biology. And I'm not sure exactly what I want to do specifically, but I'm taking all these different classes, kind of touching on a bunch of different like computational um, stuff, the simulations, and all of it's really interesting to me right now, but I don't know one specific thing that I want to do yet. It's fine. There's no, there are no right or wrong answers. It's just interesting to see where people come from. Thank you. Uh, is it Devin? Yeah, uh, my name's Devin. I'm also a junior in ISD, uh, concentrating in bio and a math, uh, minor in math. Um, so I'm kind of in the same boat as Tyler. I'm not entirely sure what I want to do right now. I've thought about doing like uh, medical devices or something like that, or I'm interested in the modeling side of it as well. So I'm just trying to kind of figure out my path as I take these courses. And Nico? Yeah, hi, I'm Nico. I'm a third year ISC student. Um, I'm actually trying to get into uh, med school so that hopefully I can be an orthopedic surgeon one day. Uh, but until then, I'm really interested in kind of exploring medicine uh, from the engineering side of it. Brian? Hi, um, I'm Brian. Uh, I'm a third year in uh, the ISC department. Um, and uh, I guess my main interest right now is biogerontology, which is the studying of aging, which I feel like that would be pretty interesting if we could ever get that solved. Um, uh, right now, what 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 this course means to me is that like i recently read an article for the homework assignment that was basically it basically explained that there is like this 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 interception between uh mathematicians and biologists but that each field kind of can't really understand each other when it comes to like mathematical modeling so that's kind of an interesting thing that our department is you know trying to solve which is computational bioengineering um, and that, that this is still a huge problem, but also like an emerging field. So that, that has made me a little bit more invested and a little bit more appreciative of this major. <laughs> yeah. I think those are really good questions. Um, this issue of aging is one that comes up, of course, everywhere. Several of the diseases we work on, diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration, polycystic kidney disease, or a diseases of aging. Of course, cancer is not uni uni only a disease of aging, but often is related to aging. Uh, when you come to infectious diseases, you know the death rate from COVID is much higher as you get older. It goes up really rapidly as you age, although young people die too. Um, and their exact reasons for that aren't completely clear. There are some which are known, uh, one of which is that your immune response slows down as you age. Another thing is that the repertory of uh, antibodies that your body can use to fight the disease goes down as you age. Uh, another one is that your thymus, which is the source of your T cells uh, and B cells, um, shrinks as you age. And so your immune response uh, goes down. And we've been working actually with a group of, of uh, uh, graduate students, uh, one of whom is in England, one of whom is uh, in the United States and one of them somewhere else. They're, they're scattered all over the world. We're actually trying to understand the uh, role of the thymus in aging mm -hmm. uh, using some modeling. Again, it's using the techniques we're developing in the second semester of this course rather than this one. 
Uh, but if you're interested in that, there might be an opportunity for uh, research collaboration, uh, specifically on on the role of the thymus in aging. So that sounds so, interesting. Go ahead. Oh no, that that sounds interesting. I might be in, interested in doing that. <laughs> so so we should we should pursue that as the semester goes on. Great. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Uh, Cal, is it Kali? Um, it's Callie. Callie. Okay. Yeah, people pronounce it different ways. Um, I'm a junior majoring in IOC and concentrating in bioengineering. I'm a pre-med student, but I also think that computational biology is a really interesting field. And that's why I'm in this class. I think computational bioengineering is interesting. I do research with Dr. Macklin on his cancer modeling. So this is all very up my alley and I really like it so far. Well, definitely people going on to medical school is great. We work a lot with clinicians uh, and uh, I think more and more uh, having some familiarity with computing will be helpful if you're an MD especially if you're going to be doing research, but even uh, in uh, normal clinical practice, I think the use of computing to improve therapies is going to be something that's going to become essential. And so uh, this kind of training uh, may not be the, 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 the bullseye of what you're doing, but it will be very valuable, I hope, to you. Okay, uh, Jeffrey? <clears throat> I, I, um... Uh, Jeffrey, I studied math and physics also as an undergraduate, um, and now I'm uh, working, uh, I'm interested in uh, more of computational neuroscience, but I'm in the master's program right now working uh, with Dr. Gumanik and more of experimental type stuff. Uh, in the FAMES lab before I tried to go into a more computational PhD program, I think. Well, I think, I think, and it's been a long time, but the, the methods we're using are not unrelated to computational neuroscience, as I mentioned. Um, I actually had some students who, who did PhDs in computational and experimental neuroscience a long time ago. Uh, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't done any work in that area myself for a long time. Uh, but it's an area that's close to my heart because of, of having done that work. So I'm happy to talk to you. And, and while, as I say, while, while the, the examples that we're going to be using are primarily going to be drawn from disease, it doesn't mean that if you have a project that you want to do that is related to another topic, uh, as long as it's a network type ODE model, uh, if you want to use a neuroscience example, that would be fine. Oh, yeah, okay. You're, you're free to do that. Okay. Uh, and is it Mercedes? Yeah. Um, so my name is Mercedes. I'm a senior in IOC with a bioengineering concentration, and then I have math and business minors as well. Um, I focus pretty heavily on medical devices and wearable devices, but I am very interested in the computational as well. So I think this class is a good one. So you're working with Greg Lewis? Uh, I've taken a couple of classes, but uh, no, I never got into like working with a specific project for him, but he's definitely been a great resource the past few years. So. Great. Okay, well, welcome again, everyone. I thought it would be nice to just, uh, you probably know each other pretty well, but I haven't gotten to see you face-to-face, uh, -face, so I appreciate your taking the time uh, and uh, we'll try to stay uh, normally I try to make this a fairly informal class. I think that there's some the, it becomes more. It tends to be, feel more formal when you do these these uh, uh, Zoom sessions. But we'll do our best to try to make it friendly and and relax. Okay. So thank you for that. Uh, can everybody still see the slides? All right. Are they still displaying? Okay. So I just want to review a couple of the things that we went over last time. Uh, all most of this will be pretty quick. But if anybody has any questions or wants me to slow down. Um, just to remind you again, we're using this Tellurium uh, modeling framework that was developed by Herbert Sauro and Andy Samoji, Herbert at University of Washington, Andy here at IU, uh, using this Tellurium package. 
Uh, we're going to be running it mostly on NanoHub, although again, you can download it and run it on your local machines and uh, Josh can help out with that if you need it. Andy can too. Um, we'll do a little bit of fitting and uh, uh, plotting and so on. That's done in Python. We'll do a little bit more of that today. So that means using NumPy. Um, and so one has to Google NumPy functions for reminders. And we now had another call with Bart Ehrmantraut who, who wrote XPP auth and uh, uh, that's very good for certain specific things which we may or may not get to. The neuroscientists, if you're doing a neuroscience project, you almost certainly use XPP auth. It's a classic tool for neuroscience. Um, we talked last time a little bit about what networks were. Uh, they're everywhere, all sorts of different kinds of networks. Um, classically in biology, you focus on signaling metabolic and regulatory networks, uh, but there also are uh, transport networks, which are uh, what are known as physiologically based pharmacokinetics networks. I was just talking so to professors of the med schools who very kindly lent me their slide decks, which we'll work over and uh, I'll work up so that we can cover some of those very medical applications. Those are used in drug discovery. Uh, pharma industry uses them a lot. Uh, toxicologists use them a lot. Population dynamics models, which is what we're working on today. And then these more um, more um, directed network models are the kind of things, this influenza transmission network. We're not really going to go into those kind of directed networks uh, in this class. Um, those are the kinds of things that uh, Alessandro Flamini does a lot of, for example. And of course, neural networks. And I want to come back to this generic idea of what models do. Um, and I hope that this will become less abstract with time. A model is something that predicts uh, a set of behaviors, something measurable in principle. Well, if it's not measurable, it's not interesting. Uh, and it does that by taking two things, which is a model structure, which we're going to spend a lot of time doing, and then some set of input parameters. It's that combination of structure and parameters that gives us outputs. Um, and when we do things like model evaluation and fitting, I uh, will find that doing fitting over parameters is something we know how to do. Fitting over model structures is something that's actually a relatively unsolved problem. A fair amount of AI and deep learning these days are devoted to understanding how to fit over model structures. Uh, so maybe at some point, somebody, maybe Jeffrey can come and tell us about AI approaches to doing that. Networks, very generic concept. It's a graph that has something called a node and it's something called the link that connects the nodes. And the idea is that links specify relationships between nodes. Nodes have states, that is variables that live on their nodes. And the links in a dynamic network specify how those states change. Um, and depending on what we're modeling, uh, the identity of the nodes, the states on the nodes, and what the links are and do will vary. And the uh, nodes are generally described as circles, squares, boxes of some kind. Links often are draw, 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 drawn with arrows uh, because there's a concept of directionality to them. And there are all sorts of different links and nodes, and we'll run into a bunch of them during the class. We're going to be using NanoHub. I think everybody by now can use NanoHub. I hope, uh, let's hope it doesn't go out on us. Uh, Zoom was going out this morning. Did anybody have problems with Zoom today in class? Uh, Zoom, Zoom failed this morning again. Um, this one thing that I should have emphasized more strongly uh, the first class is that for some reason when Tellurium is first launched on NanoHub, it gives you this annoying read-only window. And so the very first thing you can do is go to the file menu, go to new notebook, select Python 3, and then it'll give you an editable window. But then you do have to retype import Polarium as TE uh, by hand. And I usually also import NumPy as NP to have it available. And so we'll, we'll be using NumPy, so you have to remember that one. And then we went over how to upload uh, and download files. Uploading uh, inside of the Tellurium 
Jupyter Notebook loads it into your session directory, um, which may or may not be a place you know where to find. Um, you can use all of the Linux uh, CD commands and things inside of uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I'm not going to go through all of those, uh, but CD for their change directory, LS for list files, PWD for print working directory. Uh, if you're a Linux person, those are very natural. If you're a Windows person, they're less natural. Um, we'll try to avoid having to use them as much as possible, uh, but uh, it's something we will face. And I, just to come back to Tellurium, so Tellurium uh, programs will always look like this. We'll start out with import Tellurium as TE to load the library. Um, and that gives us access to all the things that we care about. And then our models were going to always be specified in this antimony strings. Um, that means, of course, that we always have two languages at work, one of which is Python and one of which is antimony. And occasionally they're, for example, their comment characters are different. Their exponentiation symbols are different. So we have to remember which is which. Um, an antimony model is put inside of a string if strings have carriage returns in Python, they have to be in triple, single, or double quotes. Um, so it looks like that, opening quotes, closing quotes. If I'm typing that in PowerPoint, PowerPoint doesn't like triple quotes. And so you have to do things to be able to type it, which is an annoyance when you're writing slides. Um, the comment character in antimony is the double slash. And I encourage you to put lots of comments into your text. Um, semicolon specified breaks between sections and can work like carriage returns. Um, and so at the end of a line, you can either have a semicolon or a carriage return or both. Um, so I could write everything in one line with lots of semicolons. Uh, something that we talked about a little bit, but I want to emphasize again now is that antimony as a language was originally written to describe chemical reactions. And so its fundamental concept is of a transformation or chemical reaction, which is why it has an arrow. Um, so for example, here I've written T becomes I1 at a rate beta times T times V. That's the model we wrote last week. Um, and that's written in antimony in the following way, T arrow I1 semicolon beta times T times V. So this is a rate law uh, for this transformation. And this one line creates two ordinary differential equations, one for T and one for I1. And the one on the left has a minus sign in front of the rate, the one on the right has a plus sign in front of the rate. Um, and if we name the uh, if we name the reaction or the equation that we've written e1, uh, we're not required to name it, but it's useful. And then the value of the rate beta t times v is actually a variable that we can access. So e1 will return the value beta times t times v. And that's just repeating what I've said here. Um, Last time, our, our entire model consisted of one line. Uh, our models will get more complex as we go on, but fundamentally writing them is not more complicated than that. If we were going to do chemical reactions and, or something uh, where we have things actually combining or appearing or disappearing, um, it's useful to know that these rate laws uh, actually are pretty sophisticated. Antimony is quite sophisticated in how it handles rate laws. And it's really when you're doing this that it becomes a much nicer thing to use than MATLAB or Mathematica. So for example, suppose I had a chemical reaction where I had three molecules of A and five of B turning into one of A, two of C, and nine of D. If I write exactly that, E2 colon 3A plus 5B goes to A plus 2C plus 9D at some rate, this happens to be what's called mass action rate. Um, one thing to remember again is exponentiation in antimony is caret, 
uh, in Python, it's double star. So you have to remember that one. Uh, this will automatically generate all of these rate laws. So I'll get four rate laws out of this. And it will automatically put in the fact that I'm getting rid of three A's and creating one. So minus two times the rate. I'm getting rid of five B's minus five. I'm creating two C's plus two. I'm creating nine D's plus nine. So if I'm writing quite complex chemical reactions, it takes care of all of that bookkeeping for you automatically. We're not going to use that so much here uh, in the kinds of equations that we're going to be using in SIR model. But when we get, for example, to um, uh, PBPK, uh, physiologically based pharmacokinetic models, then that, that mass balancing will be very convenient. Um, sometimes we don't care about mass balance. We have some source from outside creating A, uh, and we can have a dangling arrow. Nothing goes to A at some rate, and that is equivalent to saying dA by dt equals k. We could also have decay, where we don't care about where the stuff goes, it just disappears. So we can have an arrow, A goes to nothing. Classically, you have what's called first order kinetics. The rate of decay is proportional to the amount of A, like radioactive decay. So if I write E, um, the two, sorry, this has got the colon in the wrong spot, it's a typo. Should be E2 colon, A goes to nothing at rate K times A, that's equivalent to writing DA by DT is equal to minus KA. So I can have dangling arrows. If I want to write just a straight ordinary differential equation, uh, in time, dA by dt equals stuff, I can write nothing goes to A, that's equivalent to writing dA by dt equals whatever is on the, after the semicolon. If I don't like that syntax and I really want it to look like an ODE, I can always write T apostrophe equals beta times T times V. And that's also dt by dt equals beta tv. So I could write nothing, ar nothing arrow goes to t, semicolon beta t times t times v. That would be equivalent. Your choice. Um, syntactically, I wonder a little bit why it uses an equal sign instead of a semicolon. It seems to me it would be more consistent with a semicolon, but that's the language. So this would be an equivalent way of writing it. Okay. If you have the same variable in multiple lines, everything adds. So for example, if I have E1, nothing goes to T at rate K0. And then at the line E2, T plus, T plus V goes to I1. Then my rate equation for T consists of the rate equation from E1, which is dT by dt equals k0, that's from here, minus, because I'm on the left-hand side, k1 times t times v. So everything adds up. And so it takes sometimes a little bit of getting used to. If you're writing, used to writing everything in terms of ODEs, you can still write them that way. But if you want to write them using this arrow notation, you have to break them up a little bit differently. And so it may take you a few days to, to, to familiarize yourself with that. I encourage you to use the arrow notation, as I mentioned, because the arrow notation actually gives you more information than the ODs. Uh, in particular, if you're writing actual chemical reactions, uh, you can always get the ke chemical reaction ODEs from the arrow diagrams, but you cannot get the arrow diagrams back from the ODE. So it's a lossy transformation. There are also some nice tools to actually draw the pictures. So if you, you can take these uh, antimony specifications, import them, uh, and have layout tools that'll draw the nice pathway diagrams for you. Questions about that so far? Most of this we went over last time, but there are a few things that are new. When I went over the slide deck, I realized there were some things we hadn't covered in detail. Okay. Whenever we have a variable or parameter, we should specify it. Um, in the case of parameters, we're required to specify it. Antimony will crash if you fail to specify a parameter value. Um, 
I strongly recommend uh, using a comment to explain what the units of parameters are whenever you specify them. Uh, variables uh, should always have initial values specified. Uh, if you don't specify them, they default to zero, but you're better off not assuming that that's going to happen. And again, the comment is the double slot. So here are initial conditions. One of the things that uh, we came up actually I, I, that we want to be a little bit careful about is here, uh, for example, in initial condition, I have T0 is equal to 1e to the 7, so 1 times 10 to the 7 cells, and then I set T equal to T0. Why would I do that? Well, when I run this simulation, the value of T will change. If I just start out by saying T equals 1e to the 7th, I wouldn't have any way of knowing what its initial value was later on. So if I do it this way, I can always reference T0, which stores the initial value. And then T gives me the current value. Um, something to remember about antimony is that it is not a program. It is a model specification. And that has some consequences, which is that this is, this is not executed sequentially as a program, except once. So when you load an antimony model using te.load a of the model string, this model specification is parsed and turned into executable code. But after that, it's not referenced. And that comes up um, in a little bit, because if we now reference a parameter or variable, which we can do, suppose we load our model as m, then m dot parameter variable name is the value inside of antimony. So if I set m t0 to be 1 e to the seventh, m dot t0 outside in Python gives me the value 1 e to the seventh. m dot t, where t is a variable, gives me the current value of t, whatever that is. So they have somewhat functionally different forms. Uh, when we run the simulation, we can run it for as long as we like. Uh, one thing to remember is that these simulations are progressive, so that if I run s equals m dot simulate 0 comma 10, and then run again in the next line m dot simulate 0 comma 10, that will give me, the first one will take me from 0 to 10, the second one will take me from 10 to 20, so the simulation will continue where it stopped, doesn't restart. So it remembers the values of the variables when it, where it was. Uh, that's convenient if you want to continue things. It's less convenient if you want to start over and change something and do it again. So you have to actually do a reset in order to do that. The output of a simulate function is an object with a slightly strange structure. Uh, it has the names of the variables at the tops of the columns. Um, that's great for certain things. Uh, for example, the plot routine that's in, in, in Tellurium knows how to deal with that. Um, however, it's not a classic NumPy array. And so it, it NumPy, some NumPy functions will get confused by that numerical, that alphanumeric at the top, the string at the top. And we'll, we'll discuss a little bit about how to work around that today. Okay, we've used, last time we used the routine, the Tellurium plot routine, m dot plot. Uh, plot knows how to take that array and plots it. And for example, the fact that these uh, uh, key is labeled by T and I1 happens because T and I1 are put in the output of that simulate function. So that's a convenience. Um, as always, things that are convenient aren't always what you want. So you have to sometimes play with that. Um, we already used the idea of show to do overlays. So if you do a plot with show equals false, it buffers the plot, but doesn't actually put it up on your screen. Uh, then you have to use the Tellurium show command to actually display the plot that you've assembled. Um, and that's something that we'll, we'll come back to. 
something that I showed you as an example is something that you can run into as a problem. Because the antimony string is only parsed once when you load it, if in the antimony string, I did what I showed you as an example, I say, for example, T0 equals 10, I equals two times T0, so that's 20, K equals T0 over three, so that's 3.3333. And now I do TE load A, and I print those values and I get 10, um, I don't know why that typed as 19, it's supposed to be 20, 3.33. Uh, and now suppose I overwrite T0. So I set m dot t0 equals five in Python. You might naively expect that if I make t0 five, i should become 10 and k should become five over three. It doesn't because those commands are not re-executed. The Python doesn't change those commands. And so if I print this, I'll get 5, 20, 3.33. Is that clear? It wasn't clear to me. I messed that up today. I mean, yesterday when I was writing some examples, I said, why isn't this example doing what I wanted? So, um, and that's because this, this antimony string is only parsed once, and that means that these assignments are only done once. And changing a value by hand does not change those assignments. And so if I want to change i, I have to do it by hand. I'd have to say m dot i equals five times five times two. And we'll run we will run into that today. So I want to make sure that people are aware of that. Okay. I mentioned that normally if you execute simulate repeatedly, it continues from where it stopped. If we want to change parameter values and start over, we have to use a reset function. We typically use reset all, which sets variables and parameters and everything else back to their original values. Uh, but there are a number of different um, options for reset. Um, just plain reset resets the variables, but doesn't overwrite the parameter values for their originals. Um, and so those are things that you might, you might or might not want to know about. If you look in the uh, Tellurian manual online, you'll find all the details. Uh, there isn't a function which just resets the parameter values and doesn't reset the variables. Sometimes that would be convenient. Um, I mentioned the idea of uh, selecting columns. Um, and if we select columns, uh, we'll find that that can be quite useful. Um, as I mentioned, if you've named a if you've named a rate law like e1 colon t to i1, I can have that rate law output. So that gives me the derivative of t as a function of time. So that's a convenience. So now those that was what I was going to review. A uh, quick review of the basics of the pr programming. Uh, and now I wanted to come back to uh, infection. We talk, I showed this slide last time, um, basically the idea that uh, you have individuals who spread disease. That's definitely an arrow and since it's directional. Um, I suppose some, some diseases can be spread bidirectionally, but in general, you have one infected person, and one uninfected person, and the disease is spread from the infected to the uninfected person. So there's a temporal sequence of spread. And uh, there's already in this graph that I grabbed from the web, um, there's this mention of reproduction number, which is the average number of person and people, uninfected people and infected person infects. And we'll come back to that quite a bit uh, as we work through the class today. And then these plots, which I grabbed from Worldometer, uh, showing uh, COVID deaths, um, daily infections uh, in Italy, which we'll try to a model uh, with SEIR models, SIR models of the kind we're going to talk about today. And then this idea of projections of future uh, infections, which we may or may not get to in the next class. Okay. I guess one of the things that I get before I go on to the next slide, 
was a comment was that um, this, this, this pattern is classic. You see an exponential increase in the number of infections. You see a saturation, a peak. It can be either sharp or not. You see a slower decline. And if you're lucky, it goes to nearly zero and stays there. Sometimes you're lucky it goes to zero and stays there. In other cases, there's a, no, a renewed outbreak, which seems to be beginning to happen in Italy and the UK. It's definitely, it never went down that much in the United States, definitely coming back up now. Uh, there are some diseases like influenza that come back every year, twice a year. And so you'd have this basic pattern. You have a low rate of influenza all the year round. You have a spike going up, comes down again in the fall. Spike going up, comes down again in the spring. Uh, middle of the winter, influenza is fairly low. Summer, it's fairly low. So you have two peaks per year. Uh, there are other diseases which are basically more or less constant in amplitude per year. And we'll talk a little bit about, uh, maybe by the end of the class, we'll give an example about some examples why that can happen. And so now I want to build some simple models of epidemics. Um, we'll start out with um, the simplest possible one, which is very similar to the one we did in class last, last time. Uh, which is called the SI model. <clears throat> These are diseases where once you're infected, you're infected. And the concept is you're always infectious. Um, and the examples that I've had in, head, in my head were HIV, um, herpes, many kinds of hepatitis. Um, tuberculosis, of course, is bacterial, but it's also a disease that in general people never clear. Typhoid, another one. Um, and if people come up with any others to add to that list, that would be great. Um, uh, fortunately, in reality, at least nowadays, for HIV, medication could reduce viral load to make people who are infected uh, very uninfectious, um, which is nice. Um, some of these others don't have any effective treatments at the moment. Um, we're going to assume that there isn't any treatment for the, whatever the disease is. So when you're infectious, you're in, when you're infected, you're infectious. Uh, so that's a pretty harsh simplification. So we're going to model the spread of this disease. Uh, and we're going to assume that people are either in, susceptible or infected. Um, we're going to assume that uh, infected individuals neither become more immune nor die. Uh, both of which are probably not very good approximations. And so we're going to draw that as the simplest possible arrow diagram, which is S goes to I. Um, and I may not always be completely consistent, but I'll try to use the, uh, the Roman uh, S and I to represent the species names and the italics forms to represent the amounts. Um, and the rate, but conversion between susceptible infected is some speed, V, which could in principle depend on S and I. There's anything else in the model, so it can't depend on anything else. And we're gonna suppose that our initial total population is S0. Really should have probably have called it N0, but S0 it is. And that means the fraction of infected people would be I divided by S0. Um, typically, when people do this, they normalize everything. Um, and a lot of the literature, you'll see things normalized, always dividing by the total number of individuals. Um, I thought about doing that in the class and then I didn't do it. Um, we'll live with it for the moment, but you may see us oscillate back and forth between those two notations. In general, if it's uh, normalized, you write the variable name with a lowercase letter. So if I write lowercase s, that would be s divided by s0. Uh, lowercase i would be i divided by uh, s0. So lowercase s would be the fraction of the population that's susceptible. Lowercase i would be the fraction of the population that's infected. Okay. Now, if I assume that infected and uninfected people behave in the same way, which is generally not the case if the disease makes you wildly sick, uh, but would be the case, for example, with typhoid, where you can be a silent carrier, with HIV, where you can be a silent carrier, um, hepatitis, where you can be a silent carrier. 
um, then I can assume that if I interact with somebody at random in the population, the probability that they're, and I'm uninfected, and they're, the probability that they're infected is I divided by the population. Assume I'm in a mixed population. And so if I have some encounter where two people meet, the probability, if one of, if one of them is uninfected, the probability the other one is infected is I divided by S0. Now, in reality, that is never going to be true, but that's the assumption of a model of this kind. In fact, all these population models will make that assumption. Okay. So the fraction of people infected is I divided by S0. And the probability that if I run into somebody in the street or otherwise, uh, that they're infected is I over S0. And so if I have N encounters per day, uh, and I'm going to assume the probabilities are small because otherwise I have to use some, some correction factor. But if I have N encounters per day with different people, and the probability that if I run into an infected person, the probability that I get infected myself is gamma, not going to be, that's a number between zero and one. Um, then the probability that I get infected is approximately N gamma times the percentage of people who are infected, namely I over S. Again, if the probabilities get to be large, then the corrections, are, there's some corrections, because if I have 20 encounters and the probability of getting infected from each encounter is nearly one, then it's not 20 times that. I have to use a, a Poisson correction factor, but we're gonna neglect that for the moment. Okay. And this is again, assuming that all probabilities of interaction are equally likely. Usually you will see N and gamma aggregated into a parameter called beta. Um, the reason I'm keeping them separate is that when you think about treating or preventing the spread of the disease, reducing the number of encounters and reducing the infectivity per encounter are different. And so I wanted to break them out separately. Okay. okay. So in that case, the uh, number of newly infected people per day is the number of uninfected people times the rate of, at which each uninfected person becomes infected. And that rate is the number of encounters they have times the probability of infection per encounter times the fraction of people who are infected. So the rate law then V of S and I is n gamma divided by s0 times the number of infected people times the number of uninfected people. And that's the basic law. Um, if people have done chemistry, you'll recognize this as the form of what's called mass action. And so it looks like a chemical reaction, a simple chemical reaction. And I'm not sure why the figure didn't is misdisplayed here. Occasionally, PowerPoint will misdisplay figures. I'm not sure why it does. Okay. All right. So I now have my rate law, which is that S is going to turn into I at a rate n gamma over S naught times I times S. And that turns into two ordinary differential equations a decreasing ordinary differential equation for S, an increasing ordinary differential equation for I with the same rate law with a minus or plus. Last time we wrote a rate of infection in a tissue and we said T was beta times T times V. And that looks pretty similar except except that this V was a constant. Here, we're multiplying by I, which is changing. And so that's a fundamental difference in the result. Um, and we'll see in a minute that that actually gives us quite different dynamics. All right. And so we'll do our first exercise, um, which is I'd like people to fire up to Lorium uh, and write a little simulation 
uh, in which you implement this and plot it. And if you remember the one from last week, you could plot them. If you have the one from last week, you could put it into the one from last week and compare the results. And what I think I'm going to do is I will try, we'll try this out and you can tell me if it works or doesn't work. I will put Tellurium up on half of my screen and the slides on the other half of the screen. So you can see both simultaneously. Um, if it winds up that the slides are too small to read, let me know and I will stop doing it. But uh, my intent is to make it easier to see. Okay. So I'll have to unshare for a second and then I'll set it up and then I'll reshare. Any questions so far before we do that? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So. Okay, can people see that? So what I'd like everybody to do together, and I have here some code that's not what we need, um, is to try to, let's see, I wonder if I can zoom in here. Um, I'd like people to, to try to write a little program that is going to implement this equation and plot it. Um, and actually I have part of it written out already here. Some of it's not what we need. Um, we don't need any of this. So I'd like people to try to do that you can you can watch me do it, but I think it's better if you try to do it on your own too. Uh, we can also upload it. All of these demos are uploaded. But I'd like everyone to be able to, to, to work on that. Uh, we can walk through it together if you like. Uh, import to learning is TE. Import NumPy as NP. We're not going to use NumPy, so we can get rid of it for the moment. But uh, we create uh, a model string. We have one equation, E1, S goes to I at a rate N times gamma times I times S divided by S0. And I, there's another warning I have to give you about Tellurium, which is that it has reserved words like time. It winds up gamma is a reserved word because gamma is a gamma function. And so you can't have a, var a variable of parameter named gamma. It will throw an error. So I call it gamma one. Beta is all right. Alpha is all right. But gamma is a function. So gamma was a bad choice of name. Um, so that's my model. I have to specify an initial value of gamma one. I have no particular reason uh, to pick a value. But we'll assume that the probability, if you run into somebody with COVID, and they're being reasonably careful, your probability of getting infected is a tenth. So we'll say 10. We'll assume that you run into 10 people a day, n equals 10. Um, these days, that may or may not be true, depending on whether you're going to classes or not. Uh, I typically run into one or two people a day at most. 
Uh, so my n is smaller. Um, but if I were going to, to the class, to the school, I'd probably I'd be running into 50 people. And the reason, again, I want to keep those separate is I want to be able to understand the effect of those. Uh, we'll assume there are a million people. Doesn't really matter how many we pick. We're going to assume that one of those million people is initially infected. Okay. Then we're going to load the model. And we'll do and dot plot. Not, I didn't run it. So we'll say S equals M dot simulate. Uh, zero comma. Let's see how many days, I don't know how many days. And then so I walked you through that, but I'd like everybody to, to, uh, to try it. And I created a little poll instead of making everybody talk, the poll will say, are you done with the current exercise? And you can answer yes, no, need more time, need help, or uh, I don't want to do it. So let's try that, see if it works. I, th I hope that's more convenient than my continually saying, are you done, are you done, are you done? So, All right, Is that, does that work for people? He's all right. Okay. Good. All right. And I'll try to, with these kinds of things, since different people take different amounts of time, uh, if, you, if you finish an exercise and uh, you, you're, you're bored, you can always find something to do with it. You could try changing some of the parameter values. Um, you could do lots of things with it. So, so I hope, uh, don't, you don't just have to sit and wait. You can always try, uh, try uh, playing with it. Um, what I'd like people to think about when they look at this result is, and I'll show you in the next slide what the difference is between what we have here and what we did last time, because they are quite different. But I'd like you to think a little bit about uh, what this result looks like. And, and I'll ask you a lot in homeworks to say, what is, to describe what something looks like or what it means. And that's actually a trick. It seems like a simple question at some level, but it's actually fairly slippery. And I have a whole series of slides about how to do that, what that kind of question means. Um, but they tend to be, those slides tend to be rather abstract. And so uh, they, I don't think they're gonna be very meaningful until we've played with these things a bit. Um, one thing that you might ask, and we're going to actually do in a few minutes, is if I look at this curve, what I see is that my number of infected individuals stays very small up to about 10 days. And then it increases quite rapidly and almost everybody's infected by 20 days. And so one reasonable thing to ask would be, uh, how long does it take from the time the infection starts increasing till the time everybody's infected? In this case, that's about 17 day, uh, seven days. The other thing I could ask, which is maybe simpler, is how long does it take till half the people are infected? And we'll figure that one out. We'll do that. Okay. So I guess I can read Paul. So I'll let, we'll wait another second for the, well, a second, we'll wait until people finish. Somebody's still working, that's fine. Um, let me just talk a little bit more about this model. 
again, the model looks almost identical to the model we wrote last time. If I grabbed the model we wrote last week, all I would have had to do was change V in the rate law to I. That's a one line, one character change. Um, in this case, I knew that the simulation took about 20 uh, days to run through, so I picked 20. But if I had run this with, uh, if I had run this with a time that was too short, I wouldn't have seen anything. And so I might have had to adjust. I might have had to adjust things um, to be able to figure that out. So I might, or I might have made it a hundred. In that case, things would have been a little bit too long. So you have to play with these things a little bit to get a sense of what's going on. Okay. Uh, it happens for this particular case, 20 is not a bad, a bad number to use. I'm not sure what else I can do with this. Something I could try with it would be, for example, what if I started out with <clears throat> half of my population infected? Here I've got one person infected, a very small number of people infected out of a million. What ha would happen if 500,000 of them were infected to begin with? Instead of one, basically, then it's as if I slot slid my time window all the way over. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. If, uh, if you, if you, if uh, if uh, if we're waiting for some people to finish, uh, you can play. One of the nice things about these kinds of models is that playing is easy. Okay, any more questions about that? That makes some sense. All right. So here were my results. And this was our results from last time. And you'll notice that there are a bunch of things that are similar about this. They both go from zero. The number of, of uninfected goes from one to zero, or from all the population to none. Number of infected goes from none to everybody. Um, but the shapes of the curves are rather different. And so whenever you ask the question, what does it look like? There are a set of standard things you should do. And so the first thing to do is to look at the beginning at time zero and ask the question, are your values small, big, middle? So at time zero, the number of infected in both orange and green and orange curves is zero or very small, it's not completely zero because there wouldn't be any infection, very small. The number of blues is almost everybody in both cases. How are they different? Well, ask what's happening to the slope of the curve. In this case, the blue one, the slope of the curve is negative and it's steepest at zero. In the case of the blue curve from the model I've just written, the slope is zero at zero. So the slope, the change in time, the value is the same, but this change in time is very different. <clears throat> then look at large times. At large times, Blue is zero and its slope is zero. That's true also for the other one, for my viral, for my, my cellular model. Orange at large time, value is everybody, value is everybody, the slope is zero as well. So the slope and the value are both the same at large times for both models, but the, and the values are the same at small times, but the slopes are different at small times. So that's beginning to tell you about how these things are different. If I look in the middle, what I see is the rollover here happens early, it happens at one and a half days. Here, nothing seems to happen until about day 10. And then I have a rapid turnover with a maximal slope actually around day 13. So the time at which I reach a half, in one case is 13, in the other case it's one and a half days. So those are quite different. And the slope is different. The slope is maximal 
in the first case at 13 and a half days. The slope in this case is maximal at zero and it's continually decreasing as I go forward. So those are also different. And so those are the things to be thinking about all the time. At zero, values and slope. At the end, positive end, values and slope. Is there something unique in the middle? Is there some place where the slope is maximal, the slope is minimal, the value is maximal, the value is minimal? So look for those features. And those features are very diagnostic. This kind of curve, flat, steep, steepest in the middle, and then flat again, is called a sigmoid because it looks a little bit like the letter S stretched out. Sigmoids are ubiquitous in the universe because nothing can go to infinity in reality. So you always have to saturate. Uh, in biology and engineering, they're really ubiquitous. And sigmoids have a couple of basic properties, minimal value, maximal value, mid position where the slope is the biggest and the slope, four things. Now there's different, slightly different varieties of sigmoids which have some inflections on that. But fundamentally sigmoids are calculated by minimum value, maximum value, position of the middle and slope at the middle. And if you have those four things right, the details of the sigmoid function don't matter. Okay, so those are things to be thinking about. So this kind of question, the set of questions that I've outlined here are things that are going to be important and whenever I ask the question, what does it look like? How are they different? You can come back and ask those questions. And we'll come back. And if those questions are right, if those things are right, your model's doing pretty well. If you re reproduce those aspects of reality, your model's doing pretty well, even if the exact numerical values aren't perfect. If those things are wrong, your model is not doing well, even if the numerical values are pretty good. And if there's one thing you come away from this class having learned, I would like it to be thinking about limits, limiting cases, which are these questions. Because any problem you try to solve, medical problem, engineering problem, scientific problem, will do better if you start by asking those questions. And I really mean any problem. And you can come up with a counterexample, that'd be fine too. Okay. So I, what I want to do now, coming back, is I'm actually going to, I had not originally planned to do this. I added this to the class just in the past two hours. So the slides may be slightly disorganized. I asked you, what are, what's the time at which you reach a half? And I want to walk you through the little computation for doing that because we'll use it again and again. This will be a little piece of program be five lines of Python, and you'll be using it continually for the rest of the semester. So I was going to introduce it a little later, but there's no reason not to do it now. So the first thing that we have to realize is that when we start doing analysis, we're going to have to manipulate arrays. And Python is not real friendly with arrays. Python has wonderful concepts like dictionaries and lists. But one thing that it doesn't have is good old Fortran or C++ array. You can't say dim x parenthesis 100 comma 100 100 and have an array that's 100 by 100 by 100. Why Python leaves that out is beyond me, but they do. Uh, to get arrays, you have to use NumPy and you have to use NumPy arrays. I think the people who, I mean, there was some political or philosophical reason Python didn't do it, but um, so it's an add on. Uh, and so that means we're going to have a lot of NP dots uh, in our world. And I'm just, if people run into NumPy arrays, is there anybody who's never seen a NumPy array? Uh, everybody's seen them, I guess. Good. Well, if you're used to NumPy arrays, this should be review. If you haven't seen NumPy arrays before, they're annoyances, but we have to deal with them. So uh, a NumPy array uh, is, a, is an array. It can have an arbitrary number of dimensions. Uh, it's structured like a list. And so indexing uses square brackets because that's how in lists uh, square brackets are. And, and uh, 
there is a whole set of things called slicing, which are ways of manipulating arrays. And they're actually very sophisticated kinds of things you can do with arrays, slicing, like get all the elements in the array from element 97 up to element 502, from your current element to the end, from the beginning to the middle, uh, going backwards in the array. Um, and you'll see lots of columns. Columns uh, in, in arrays represent iterators. Um, and uh, I'm not going to, we'll use them later, but we'll try to uh, leave them out for the moment. Um, one thing that can be a little bit confusing when you're referencing NumPy arrays is that the indices don't go inside of a single set of parentheses the way they would in C or Fortran. They go in separate sets of arrays. So if I have a NumPy array S, S square bracket integer index value gives me the row of the array that so cuts the row. If I then do a second square bracket with a number inside of it, it gives me the column in that row. So if I want to say what would be in Fortran, S parenthesis index comma zero, close parenthesis, uh, in NumPy will be S square bracket index, close square bracket, open square bracket, zero, close square bracket. And that's not always, that's, if you come from other languages, that's not obvious, but that's how they do it. Um, and so if I want, if I say M equals R dot simulate zero comma hundred comma hundred square bracket time, and there's a missing um, apostrophe I close apostrophe, that'll give me an array, which consists of two columns. The first column is the time. The second column is the value of I. If I do M square bracket one, that returns the second row of the array because everything in Python is zero indexed. So that'll give me now a list, which is time one comma value I one. If I want to get time one, I would say M square bracket one, square bracket zero, close square bracket. That would return time one. M square bracket one, square bracket one will return the value I1. And again, you can do fancier things with iterators to get pieces of the arrays, which we're not going to use at the moment, okay? So now what I'd like you to do is take the little program that we have here and use slicing and I can come back and uh, do that. Um, use use the column selection and slicing to find the time at which i is one half its original value. Okay. So I'd like everybody to spend. A, I'll spend it. Everybody. I want everybody to think about that. Work on it for five minutes on their own and then I'll do it with you and we'll see if we come up with the same solution. Okay. So does anybody need, do people need me to put back what the slice looks like? Is the assignment, is the, is the task clear? S contains the output of our simulator. If I just want to get the, if I just want to get the value of, of, of uh, susceptibles, and the time, I have to use the column selector, time, comma, S like that. And that'll give me two columns. If I didn't, if I didn't do that, I get three columns. I get time, S and I. Okay, so why don't we do that? Let me run that. So why don't we try that? So I want you to go use slicing now to find the time at which S is equal to S zero over two.
And again, if people, if people, if that makes no sense and it's confusing, raise your hand, text me, and we'll we'll, we'll explain it. And maybe you'll come up with a better way to do it than I do. People can continue to work. I'm going to try to do it myself. I have I have the, all of these my solutions to these already loaded up in in both Canvas and in the, in the shared Google Drive. But I'll do it myself as well. So I'm going to try. I'll I'll I'll, I'll type silently while other people type, and then we can we can see if we come up with the same solution. Yes, you can absolutely do that, Josh. There, there are all sorts of fancy ways to find the position where the where the difference is the smallest. And so, um, um, Josh, Josh just shared a nice uh, uh, some nice code that actually uses NumPy to find the, the specific place where the value is closest to the midpoint. Um, I I just sent that to you anyway, though. I didn't share it with everyone. I wanted I wanted people to work it out. So so there are definitely there are definitely a lot of ways to do this. In fact, if you if you ask the question, uh, if you, Google knows everything. So if you type in in Python, how do I find the value of an, in in a NumPy array which is closest to a target value? It will give you the code. Uh, but I, I wasn't going to do anything that fast. <laughs> right. Well, I mean. To be fair, that's pretty much how most people solve uh, like small coding problems like that. Usually winds up in Stack Overflow, yes. Right. Uh, I mean, so, no, there's not, nothing wrong with doing any of that. No, I'm not, I'm not being critical at all. I think it's right. very good. It, it's right. just that it's, it, uses, it uses a slightly more sophisticated set of, of commands uh, which I wasn't planning on introducing now, but but absolutely, if people want to do something fancy, uh, there is some code here that'll do that. 
uh, and that's a very Pythony. What I did, in a sense, is a very Fortran way of doing it, which is step through and look at the values. Uh, uh, the using the NumPy, the NumPy uh, find mins is is a very Pythony way of doing. It. I'm afraid that shows my age that I do it the way I did it. So did, did did people come up with better solutions than mine? Did people come up with one like Josh's? Um, did people did people come up with some solution? Does anybody have no solution at all? Anybody want anybody? So so in any case, go ahead. Oh no, I was just saying I need to practice. <laughs> okay. Well, that's why that's why I wanted to do it. So let me let me walk you through what I did. Which is very, which is very, as I say, very, very Fortran, -y, very procedural. Uh, and and using NumPy arrays is already very procedural, right? The whole point of Python is you're not supposed to use arrays; you're supposed to use lists and dictionaries. But in any case, uh, we can be we can be uh, old fashioned. Procedural so, is good also for educational purposes because you understand what the underlying code is actually doing. So, so what we have here is the following. We have an, if we do, let's, let's, let's look at what S looks like. So let's just print S to see what we have. S has got two columns. The first column is the time and the second column is the, is the, uh, the value of, of uninfected. Okay. And now I'm going to walk through this line by line. And I'm going to look for where the value of S decreases to what I'm cut my target. So I set an index of zero. I could use a for loop, but I'll use a while loop. So I have a while, I set an index to zero. I say while S index, index gives me the I the nth I throw. So index one will give me this row, zero will give me this row, one will give me the second row, two will give me the third row, and so on. So I'm walking through row by row. And I want the second column of my row. So index sub S sub in square bracket index square bracket zero gives me the first, sorry, the first column of the and throw, and that's a time. If S sub index in the second row is bigger than M dot S zero, S zero I carefully saved with my initial number of individuals, is bigger than a half, then I keep going. So the first time it goes below a half, I exit my loop. And I've saved the time at which that occurs. And in principle, maybe I should be one more or one less, but I'm not going to fuss about that. And so this loop will run until it gets to a point where the second column is less than 500,000. And it will return the time, mid time, is the value in the first guy at which that occurred. And then it prints it. And so it prints it at time 13.73 out here. The number of uninfected was 469060, which is just below half. Now, if I really wanted to be fancy, maybe I should be one less, but it's close enough. Did somebody else come up with a more elegant solution than that? Is it is it clear how that works, or is it is it okay? I think I understand it a little better. So we can we can we can walk through that uh, more times if you want. So what I'm I'm doing is I have a list, and I'm stepping line by line through the list, mm -hmm. and I'm looking if the second column of my list in that row is bigger or less than some threshold. Mm -hmm. If it's bigger than that threshold, I don't care and I keep going. And that when it, when I get to the point where it's just below my threshold, I found the thing I want and I stop. 
That's why I used a while loop. Mm -hmm. I could also have used a for loop where I go through the whole list and I only save the value if it meets some condition. I could use a for loop with a break condition, which exits that loop when certain things happen. Uh, so there, there are quite a few ways to do it. I could also do what, what Josh did, which is actually use um, um, there, NumPy has a whole variety of functions to operate on lists and on arrays. And so you can have NumPy functions that will give you the biggest value in an array, the smallest value in an array, the index of the biggest and smallest values, the mean value of the array, the mode value of the array, all of those exist in NumPy. NumPy is extremely powerful in terms of its pre-existing function. The only problem with them is that there's so many, remembering them is not always easy. And, and remembering how to have them operate on the right part of the array is not always easy. So we want to know when the value in the second column is equal to something. And so you have to then learn how to tell the NumPy functions which column you want to operate on, which row you want to operate on. And so those slicing operators become rather can become quite elaborate when you do that. Hmm. Um, that was another reason I did it in the simpler way here. Um, but but we're not going to do. I mean, really, the, for the, well, when we started doing fitting, we'll do a little bit more Python. Uh, but uh, this is about the level of Python that we're going to be using. If this is again, this can be unfamiliar. If 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 you need a refresher on Python, I, I do recommend that Rosalind online tutorial um, because it really does a lot of this kind of array manipulation because it's about it's doing bioinformatics. So it says, let's think we start out with a string which consists of C G A T A G G G G G. Let's count how many C's there are in the array. Let's count how many T's there are. Let's find out where the fifth T is. It's all array. It's all list and array slicing. And so if you really want to know how to use colons and commas in, in, in array iterators, uh, Rosalind will teach you that really well, uh, efficient. Um, uh, Stack Overflow has, has tutorials on it too. And I, like Josh, I never, I, I, I don't do them enough to remember them. And so I frequently will, will type in you know, array slice uh, Stack Overflow and look it up to remind myself. Um, again, the fact that you, the fact that to get X comma Y, the X and Y are not in the same set of parentheses, but are in separate sets of parentheses to me seems somewhat unnatural. Uh, uh, but that's how, again, that's how Python does it. The basic iterators for and while behave the same as in other languages, but, but uh, the slicing is a little bit different. Okay, okay so. So just walking through this again, uh, did I come up with the same code? Uh, yeah, I came up with the same code. Uh, so again, uh, index equals zero. We go, we're gonna iterate over index in the while loop. Uh, we check whether S at in the row, index, first column, second column, sorry, is bigger than or less than our target. If it goes from being bigger than to less, we exit our loop. We save the position at which we exited the loop and that's our result. Okay. So that was exercise 2.1 A. Um, now, what I wanna do is I wanna scan um, for example, I want to change S0 or something else. And I want to know how that time changes as a function of that. Suppose I changed, I don't know, gamma. How does the time to reach one half change as a function of gamma? So now I'm going to have to keep rerunning my simulation. This returns the time to which I get, at which I get a half value for one simulation, for one set of parameters. And now I'm going to iterate and run that simulation many times for different parameters. And I want to accumulate those in an array and plot them. And so now again, the fact that 
Python doesn't intrinsically have arrays uh, is going to be a mild annoyance. Um, and so, and again, if, if this is unfamiliar, we'll give you the code so you can do it, but familiarizing yourself would be good. Nothing very complicated, but the, the more familiar it is, the better. And so I want to show you how to do this. So the second one is uh, let's not worry about accumulating at the moment. Let's write a little parameter scan. And we did this already last time. Let's write a little parameter scan uh, that changes um, S0. And this is going to run into a problem, which is that you're going to also have to change the value of S. Because if you look in my code here, if I highlight, people can see this. If you look in my code here, I say S0 is equal to a million. I equals one, S equals S0 minus I. If I change the value of S0 in Python, the value of S is not going to be changed. And so I have to now change the assignment. I have to do both changes by hand. So is the assignment clear? <coughs> the little exercise is clear. I want you to sweep the value of S0, say over a factor of 10, by, by, by factors of 10. And I want to plot on one graph uh, the outputs. And this actually is exactly the simulation we wrote last week. And so if you look at the simulation we wrote last week, you can import that code. Uh, but I'd like people to try to try to do that. I'll give you a few minutes head start and then um, and then I'll I'll type my version of it. So we're actually going to ignore this code that we've just written here for the moment. We'll come back to it in a minute. And the big question is going to be do the times when half the population is infected change. Uh, for the moment, we'll, we'll set that, we'll, we'll do that visually. We're not going to do that numerically. One thing is probably would be useful would actually be to save all of these examples, not only as Jupyter notebooks is, but as regular Python, because if they're, if they're in Jupyter notebook format, then you can't open them in notepad and copy and paste them easily. Whereas if you save them as regular Python, then you can open them in a, in a notepad and, and cut and paste them. Really easily. One of the problems with Jupyter Notebooks is because it saves everything. It saves everything in this nice uh, typeset form. It has a lot of, of special characters and, and additional material in it when you look at it as plain text.
I don't want to distract you too much by talking, but one thing that I will try to do in all of these exercises is make them incremental so that the little things that we'll do in one exercise will be things that you'll want to save because you'll use those code snippets again and again. So I'll try to introduce simple coding ideas and then we'll, we'll apply them repeatedly and build them up. So for the, for the one or two people who've gotten this done quickly, um, you can play with changing different parameters, seeing how things depend on other parameters. Um, and so I, there's actually quite a bit you can explore, even in a very simple model like this, you can explore quite a bit. And the exercises we'll do in class won't, won't cover all those possible explorations. So I hope every now and then there'll be some time when one's bored because there really isn't anything to do. But but in general, these problems are open-ended enough that we'll just begin to, to, to bite at their heels in class. We won't cover them. Okay, great. All right, so here's how I would do this. Um, again, people may have better ways. I'll do a four loop. Okay, I do four loop four. Um, 
E one in range. Now let's do zero comma seven comma one colon. And now I'm going to do a M. I have to use the reset. I just have to reset my simulation. I don't want to reload it. And now I'm going to set my initial value. M dot S zero equals 10 to the E one. So that'll give me zero one. 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million. And I have to remember, this is where that warning came in, that S doesn't automatically get set to be the reciprocal of that. So minus one isn't really a big deal, but if I had I bigger, it would matter. M dot S is equal to M dot S zero minus M dot I. Now I run my simulation and I'll do a plot of that simulation and I can do both. I don't need to have the, I don't need to have just that column I have to do that. And that uh, plot, I need to hold and not show it. So equals false. And then when I'm outside of my loop, I need a TE dot show. Let's, did people have something? Let's see if that works. Did people do something like that? Oops. Typo. Where is my typo? Not the prettiest thing in the world, but okay, so. something isn't quite right, is it? It's, oh, because it's on a log scale. So it, so I should probably put this on a log scale if I want to see what I've got. And for a log, I would have to remind myself what log scale is. Um, I think it's y scale equals, I have to look it up. Somebody can look it up. Or I can look at I can look at my answer. Let's see what I can. Do. Okay. I used I I used the code when I did this for myself. I used the code from last week where I had those things put into it. So let's see how it came came out in my version here. For I called it pop exponent instead of x e one range one comma eight reset all. Set the values, that was okay. Simulate, and then um, here, see why, what is different here? Simulate m dot plot. So equals false. All right. So I'm not sure why I have the extra. Oh, I know because I started with zero. No, it still doesn't look the same, does it? Anybody see what I did wrong? Oh, here, because here I used a linear, I, I, I said to do it in log and here I did it in linear, linear range. So. Here I did log scale, but here I did linear. So what what do I see here? Somebody tell me, looking at these curves, how are they different? Well, the initial number of cell, initial number of individuals is different by a lot. 
but is the time at which I begin to have massive infection different? the time at which I reach one half of my maximum value different? Looks to me like they're the same. I could actually check that if I wanted to. I could grab my little function here, which finds the time. And I could move it. Why don't we do that? Why don't we move it inside here? And if I'm going to print, I should probably print which one of these it was. So I'll print S. S0 equals comma. And I'm going to print um, M dot S0. So in this case, I said that it doesn't look like the time to which getting to half is very different. It's not quite the same. 13.7 for a million, 13 for 500,000, 12.52. So I was wrong. The time does vary to get to the middle, the half infection it does vary. Not by a lot, but by some. Couldn't see it just looking at the graph. Were people able to make that change? Can everybody, was everybody able to do that? Give it a shot. All I did was grab my code and move it inside of my loop. And I, since I didn't save this, I'm actually gonna save it for myself. This was exercise two, that midpoint A, rename, and I'll download it so that I've got a copy. As I say, I'd always recommend downloading your code because it's easy to read. Everybody got that one? Questions about that so far? Okay. Okay, so now let's do one that I think is more interesting, which is um, let's, uh, let's change I0 instead of S0. So now we're gonna say we have the same number of infected, in, the same number of total individuals, a million, but we're gonna change the number of initially infected individuals. How does that change? Well, that's going to be pretty easy to do. All I have to do here is change the number of I S to I here. Oops. And in this case, I'm going to want E1 to be um, Ten to the one. Again, I'd like you to try to do this on your own if possible. So we took the code that we had just written and we switched it from scanning S to scanning I.
You'll notice if you, once you get it running, you may take you take your time on this, that the bigger the initial number of infected individuals, the faster things happen. Basically, as I increase the number of infected individuals, the time to uh, have the infection spread goes earlier. And even though I'm increasing the number of infected individuals, Oh, I did something silly here. M dot I isn't meaningful. I mean, I did something silly because M dot I will have changed by the time I get here. So it's, it's got to be actually. The number of infected individuals. Initially, it's gone 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, a million. The time at which I reach half is moving linearly over to the right. So every tenfold increase in numbers of infected individuals only shortens the time to maximal infection by what? About two and a half days. That's sort of an interesting result. I think it's an interesting result. I would not necessarily have known that. I would not necessarily have known that if I had not done that simulation. Don't know why it doesn't want to download. Okay. This wouldn't be a bad time to take a break where we ran over a little bit. So, so people who, people who are done with the exercise, everybody's done? Okay, so in that case, why don't we take a break? We'll take a five minute break and resume at seven o'clock. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, I'll see you in a few minutes. Hey, Josh, how's it going? You're muted. Yeah, going good. Um, yeah, just I, I think I'm a little bit obsessed over, over this fitting stuff. So it's OK. Should probably put it away for a little bit, let it rest, and then come back to it. Not too long, since we need it next week. Well, I don't know. We may not kick it. Worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. I talked to TJ, and he mentioned he said that uh, he was willing to write a wrapper around his own code as long as we don't distribute it, uh, because he wants to develop it into a, into a. Right. But I'm pretty sure I can make something work. But I would, I would go to, I would send it to Andy and ask him why you're getting those C vote convergence errors because you shouldn't right. be. The other thing is that if you measure the area under the curve, you can normalize everything, and then you have one fewer fitting parameter, right. which makes it a lot easier.
I actually think it's sort of, I, I find this is sort of a pretty result, actually, this one. The fact that the exponential increase in the number of individuals has a linear change in the time of infection. So why is that the case? Ah, uh, it's actually a good question. Basically because the, 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 uh, the number of people infected goes up exponentially. Right. And so basically that, right. that that's, that's it. Right, right. At least at early times. It's not quite linear if you look at slightly off because it's because there's because of the saturation, but early on it's an exponent. Just the way in that first one, the time doesn't move very much, but it's not quite. It, it moves a little bit because the approximation isn't, isn't perfect. So you can actually do quite a bit even with this very, very simple model. And it's not a good model for, for COVID, but it, but, but it was quite a bit of, of, of result, quite some, some interesting results hiding in it. I don't understand my local optimizers are working fine but i don't i don't want once see if i start at, at, at those close enough local optimizers are fine those global optimizers i don't understand what they're like what they're doing <laughs> why they I mean i mean at least at least um before before we had that floor and that uh basin hoping is not moving away from anywhere uh but dual annealing seems to be exploring the space really well, but it's just jumping everywhere. And there seems to be like, just like very small, like place where the solutions is fine, is good enough. Yeah, well, that's what's called the golf ball or golf course potential. Right, right. And there is no, there is nothing you could do. Right. In other words, if, 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 big, if, if the parameters being far away, changing the parameters has essentially no effect on the residual, Right. And nothing you do is going to help. Right. The only thing you could do then is what the answer then is that RMS deviation is not the thing you need. Mm -hmm. yeah. and Javier is rather good to this in what he's doing that 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 you have to have you have to come up with a, some kind of error metric that actually has the slope you want. So right. so something to do would be say look at the area under the curve or look at the maximum value. Right. And use that as a separate constraint in addition to the RMS deviation. That makes sense. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, people use RMS because they're chi squared because it's the simplest one. Right. But in fact, uh, very often it doesn't tell you what you want. RMS on the raw data is highly sensitive to the, the variance at the maximum values, but doesn't care about small values. If you take the logarithm before you do RMS, then it tells you, then it's fold change no matter what the value is. And that tends to overemphasize small values at the expense of big values. Right. Uh, taking an absolute value and summing the absolute value of the difference is in between. It's equivalent to square root metric. Um, and so, so it's a, there's, uh, because I, 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 success, 
uh, I successfully wrapped it around uh, this other wrapper that Holbra uses, and they do have preset uh, cost functions. Okay. So I can look at the maybe change the the yeah. cost from cost, cost function. Yeah. Okay. So well, is everybody back? People people ready to get started again? Great. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, welcome back. Yeah. I, I'm sure five minutes doesn't seem like a lot when you're sitting all afternoon. People may be hungry, thirsty. Okay. So, um, just continuing here, um, we saw this result already, which is that the bigger the initial number of infected individuals, uh, the faster the epidemic sweeps the population. And we saw that a, an exponential increase in the number of infected individuals results in a linear shortening of the time to infection. And that's basically because at short times, the, the number of infected individuals increases exponentially. So now let's suppose we want to actually take what we've just done and plot it. Um, to do that, we're going to need to use another uh, NumPy function. This is again dealing with the fact that we don't have built in arrays of the kind we might use in another language. Um, and we're going to use a function that's quite convenient, uh, which is called. I'm sorry. Uh, which is called uh, VStack. Uh, VStack basically builds arrays line by line or row by row. Um, and if you know how big your array is going to be from the beginning, you can declare the array. But if we're going to iterate over something, we may not know how big it's going to be and we want to actually be able to assemble the array. That's actually quite, quite a powerful thing to do. Uh, and so what we're going to want is, for example, we're going to scan some parameter. It could be I, it could be gamma, something else. We want the first, first column, the first column, the column, the first column to show the value of the parameter, and the second column to be the result, whatever it is. Could be the time to get to half of the maximum value or something like that. And so to use to do that, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to create an empty array. That's a sort of a funny concept. Uh, and NumPy has uh, a command, which is called empty, which generates an empty array. And we know that we're going to have two columns. And to begin with, we have no rows. And so npy dot empty parenthesis shape equals zero comma two generates a placeholder of two columns and no rows. And so we're going to put that in something we're going to call result, or there could be anything we want. Um, and so that that's something that if you haven't used NumPy in Python may be unfamiliar. Uh, again, this is one of these things where once we've figured out how it works once, we'll keep using it. So you don't have to look back at how it works continually. And then if you want to add things to the end of an array vertically, you use NPy, NumPy VStack. And you could imagine that VStack was called on the array uh, in which case you'd have something like array dot, which would work like um, what happens with lists where you have uh, list dot append. Uh, but that's not how VStack works. VStack works more like a, a MATLAB command. So you would say, uh, suppose we have a matrix and we want to extend the matrix vertically. We say matrix equals NP dot VStack and then open regular parentheses and then inside square brackets because it's a list matrix comma and then the thing we're going to append. And so that's a syntax that may be unnatural un, un or unfamiliar, but we have to learn it. Um, and we can in principle add as much as we want glom it together. We're going to be adding one row at a time at the moment, but you could take two big arrays and mash them together. 
However, the key thing is that the number of columns has to be the same. So if we try to append uh, a, an array with five columns to an array with two columns, then you'll get an error. Okay. So what we're going to do is we'll say if we call our initial empty array result, we'll say result equals npy dot vstack. Oh, regular parenthesis, square bracket, result, comma, and then the thing that we're appending. And and uh, I originally thought we um, we might hold off on this till later, but we're going to need it, so we might as well uh, use it. But and again, I if you if you if you find can if you find it confusing, Google npy np dot numpy dot vstack and you'll you'll find lots of examples. Okay. The other numpy function that we're going to find useful which I want to remind you of is that uh, the standard, this is another Python-y thing. The standard Python iterator only does integers. So range only iterates over integer. And typically we, we want to be able to iterate over real numbers. And so you have to use, instead of using the Python range function, we'll use npy a range function, which looks just like range except that you can use real numbers floats instead of integers so instead of saying for x in range start end step we'll say for x in np dot a range start end step and in that case we can have start be 1.6 and be 5.2 and step be 0.1 um, i'm not sure why um, python didn't include that but they didn't uh, one thing you have to be careful of when you use numpy a range is that if you make start one, step 10, end 10, and step one, it will function exactly like range, and the output will be an integer. X will then be an integer. And if something is expecting a float, you'll get an error. So if you want to go from one to 10 in steps of one and you want it to be a float, you have to use 1.0 or one point, 10 point, and so on to force it to be a float. These are more Python, Python annoyances. Uh, people who are familiar with Python uh, will be, will know this already. People who haven't used Python before, um, you'll get familiar with it uh, rapidly, I hope. Uh, but these are the kinds of things that makes it easy to make mistakes. Python is an extremely powerful language. It's also a language in which it's really easy to write mistakes that are hard to debug. And so I'm trying to give you a heads up on common places you can have errors. All right. So now uh, what I'd like you to do is take what we've just written and create a matrix that has in the first column the value of i that we used. And in the second column, as the output, which was that time to uh, time to um, reach half half value, okay. It's like is that a clear 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 assignment? So effectively, what we're going to do, we're going to need to use that, and I should probably have, have had that on the slide as well. We're going to have to create an empty matrix to hold our result, and I'll step back to show you that again. And then we'll use vStack to add to it. So remember the command to create an empty matrix was array, or in this case, result equals np dot empty, parenthesis shape, let me actually grab if I end this PowerPoint, I think I can do that. Let me I grab it. I'll, I'll put that in that, in that line. So, not fair to have that. It's not fair to have that out there.
Okay, so now you have everything you need uh, text-wise. Okay, is that is that clear? Apologies for letting for leaving out that little that that critical thing. And for people, for people who are, are very Python and, and NumPy savvy, I appreciate your patience getting everybody up to speed on this. Uh, I think it's important that we all have the same basic uh, skill set, uh, and then once we have that, it'll make it'll let everybody move through the the science of this and the engineering of it a little faster. Um, again. There aren't that many things that we need to do with with the Python, but there are a few things that we do all the time. And so uh, it takes a little bit of time to learn. That. And as a hint, you have to add precisely two lines to the code we have on the screen. So I'll I'll do it in parallel with people. And again, your your approach may differ. I'll say matrix equals np dot empty parenthesis shape equals parenthesis. And I want no rows and two columns because we and just a placeholder, an empty top label doesn't have anything in it. And so that gives me a place to store my results. And now I'm going to print them and I'm going to store them at the same time. So I'll say matrix equals np dot vstack square bracket matrix um, and now the thing i want to append and the thing i want to append is going to be my value of i naught which is here and the time Yeah, that was 
like I have an extra, no extra. There's a missing, there's a missing square bracket there that I didn't have. Okay. And that doesn't do, I mean, I can't tell if I did it right or not. So let me here, after I've done my loop, I don't need this m dot plot here, it's not doing anything. Let me print matrix and see what I have for that. Okay, so that is very important. Uh, matrix is not defined. Also, the type in. Okay. And so now I have my first column, I0, second column, the time, which is exactly what I had printed out here already. Do people want to keep working on that or that's all I want. Okay. So that work. And now we could walk through that code a little more, but I think everybody's got it. The last thing is that we've been using the intrinsic uh, Tellurian plot function, which assumes certain kinds of shapes. There's also something called the plot array, which is matplotlib plot. Um, and so why don't we simply uh, add, add that plot, the plot our result. Instead of graphing, instead of printing it. So instead of print matrix, we can do te dot plot array matrix. And that's our result. And why don't you change? Why don't I ask you to change the um, change the uh, iterator? So instead of this is pretty jagged and ugly. So why don't you change the iterator so that it's smooth? So instead of using a NumPy using range, why don't you use NumPy a range to actually give a smooth result? Instead of saying E1 in A range, in range one to seven, with step to one, I'll say in N pi A range, one to seven, step to point one. This will take longer to run. And since it's gonna print so much, if I hide that, so I don't have it in my way. Let's run that. By that made a mess. Um, and actually, once this got to be too big, it wasn't very interesting. So I should probably change the maximum value. So it's not something so big. There we go. So what am I plotting here? I zero. That x axis is the number of initially infected individuals. And the y axis is how long it takes for half of my population to get infected. So. So 
why don't people play with that a little bit? So people, though there certainly will be variations on this code because sometimes we won't be looking for the half time. We'll be looking for the time at the end. We'll be changing the, here, here I have the initial number increasing exponentially. Sometimes it'll be linear. Sometimes it'll be one over something. Uh, but this basic process, which is to iterate over a parameter, measure something, and then plot the outcome of that measurement versus the parameter, something we'll do again and again and again. And so this basic loop where we load a model, we create a placeholder to store our results. We iterate over some parameter, change the parameter, reset our model, change the parameter value in the model, run our simulation, make a measurement on the simulation, stack the result and plot that stacked result. That's something we're gonna do continually. I would say almost every lecture will do that. And so the basic code structure that you've written here is something that we're going to need to use again and again. Some of the details will change, but the basic ideas are things we're going to use again and again. I have a question on that polling. Can you change your answer in the poll or once you've said, I need more time, are you stuck never being able to say you're done? Once I answer the poll, it kind of disappears. Okay, so that's really not very convenient because what you really would like is something that says where you can answer when you're done. I guess what you could do, what I could do is I could just set up the poll so you don't answer it until you're done. And then that'll keep a running score on how many people are finished. How's that? Does that work? It's worth a try. Okay. Because I don't like to keep having to ask. On the other hand, I don't want, I could be sitting here for an hour while everybody's waiting. <laughs> if you exit out of the poll, like without answering it, the poll option comes up on your control panel on the bottom. And then you, when you click on it, you can press done. So okay. it doesn't disappear if you just exit out of it for a second okay. while you're finishing. Oh, so you, you've taught me something about how polling works because, because I can see that you answered it, but then I, but okay. But, the, but I think the simplest thing is just if, if, if you need help, click need help because then we want to help. But if, if, uh, if, if, if you're not done, don't answer it until you're done. And then I can see, keep account. Because typically what I'll do is I'm not going to necessarily, depending on the exercise, I won't necessarily wait for everybody to finish, but I'll wait for almost everybody to finish. And then I'll figure that the, the people who are taking a little more time can watch while I go through the exercise uh, in parallel. And of course, you're always free to unmute and say, hey, please wait. That's all right, too. Don't be shy about that. Because I don't want I don't want people to feel that they're being rushed. On the other hand, I don't want people also to be. I, it's hard for me sometimes to know exactly how long it's going to take people to do things. Some things that I think are easy take people more time, and some things that I think are hard, everybody does immediately. So, I'm not okay. So we've got that, um, and this one. Let's see, why did this one come out so much prettier than the one I did? The way, reason it came out prettier was that I used, not in, in this version on the computer here, I used 
a linear, a linear one rather than a, 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 a an exponential fit. So let's try what I've got here. If it's And this is where you have to use the points, otherwise it'll give you images. And then we'll use A1. That's running over a lot of values, so make this way one. I realized I went to 10,000 here, I went to 100,000. Crash my kernel. Got a little jaggy to it, but it's not too bad. Not sure why it's not identical. But... Oh, the number of intermediate points. Okay, everybody got that? All right. So now that you have this code, and again, I understand it may take a little bit of playing with to get more familiar with. Now that you have this code, you can do a lot. So I want to talk a little bit about this. We're not going to use this immediately, but this is a little bit more about Python array manipulation, NumPy array manipulation. So we've already talked about how to use um, the, uh, to tell, simulate which columns to give us. Um, and if I want to do a lot of runs and put them, so far we've been doing runs and plotting them independently using show false and then displaying it at the end. Sometimes I might actually want to build an array which I, has time in the first column, the value of the first run in the first second column, the value of the second run in the third column, the value of the third run in the fourth column and so on. There are a number of ways I can do that. One of the easiest ones to do it would be to do an R dot simulate where I just have the time column. So that's a simulator, which is basically doing like, it's basically doing an A range and it's not very interesting. And then I can run my simulation and just print out the values I want. And if I've got the simulate set to be the default, it'll do the same times each time. There are, there are simulator commands where the time step isn't uniform and then that won't work. But in this case, you'll have exactly the number of time steps is the same. If I say go from time zero to 20 with 100 intermediate points, each time you'll have 100. Okay. And so I have a column now which contains just my data set. So I have one column with the time and then one column with the data set. And then just the way VStack assembles an array with rows, adds rows, <coughs> HStack adds columns to an array. 
And so I can use array one equals n pi h stack of array one comma array two, and it combines them horizontally. <clears throat> In this case, I don't have to create an empty array because I use that first run to get my list of times to create the array, and I'm adding to it from the right. And just the way when I did it vertically, the arrays that I combined had to have the same number of columns. In this case, the arrays have to have the same number of rows. So if I make, if I have try to add an array with a different number of rows, it will crash. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to use that uh, immediately, uh, but one could do that um, if one wants to assemble data. So you get a loop like this for S in n pi a range. I reset my function. I set the value of S in my simulation, whatever it is. I run the simulation and I keep adding the values for different months. So I could do a plot this way too. We're not going to use this much right now, but it's interesting. I wanted to talk a little bit about plots. Um, I can use that plot, um, plot array function. It has the same show false argument that regular plot has. Um, and then te plot array will, will display, or I could do the show plot, the, show, the t dot show. And there are a couple of things that are nice in plot array. I don't know if they work in the regular plot as well. They might. Um, there's a function called, peculiarly enough, um, reset color cycle equals false. And reset color cycle equals false gives each line in your plot a different color. Um, and that can be a convenient thing to do. Um, plot array does not, as you see here in this graph that I'm showing here, doesn't have that little key that we have automatically using the T dot, the, the M dot plot function. Um, and so if I want to have the uh, lines labeled, <clears throat> I can create a label and uh, there's a function here called labels, which can be added to plot array. Um, and the argument of labels is a string in a list. And remembering that can be a pain, but that's how it works. Um, the, 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 it's documented in the uh, Tellurian manuals. And uh, you can refer also here uh, if you want to see examples of it. Um, but if you use uh, color cycle equals false and then labels, you can have your lines colored and then have a key that, that has the values for each line for the parameter. So if you want to make these parameter plots nice, uh, that's, a, that's a game you can play. Okay. I'm not going to ask you to do that today, but at least you've seen it. So if you want to do it, okay. That's is just another example um, of how to use that that label that label function. Um, the label is the that list of labels is actually a list, and so. In this, this case, I added the labels one at a time using plot false. In this case, I've stacked all of my variables together um, in one big stack. And then I give a list of labels and it colors, it applies the first label to the first, to the second column. The first column is assumed to be time. It applies the first label to the second column, the second label to the third column, the third label to the fourth column and stuff. Um, so if you want to do plotting, you can do that. If you really want to do fancy plotting, probably people want to look up matplotlib plotting functions. Um, and again, the documentation in Tellurium has lots of fancy plots if you want fancy plots. Uh, but these are some of the ones that I found useful over the years. Okay. So let's um, just do one more sweep. Uh, now let's do actually a scientific sweep now that we have our code. Um, let us scan not 
the initial number of individuals infected, nor the um, total population, but let's scan gamma. Gamma was the probability that you are infected per encounter. And you'll have to think a little bit about what a range of gamma that's meaningful is. Um, clearly, uh, that gamma value, the probability of being infected per encounter can't be bigger than one. Um, could be small, but it can't be bigger than one. Um, so let's try sweeping that. So what would you have to change? You'd have to change your for loop to be a reasonable range. And you'd have to change how you set the parameter here. And then, of course, the value. Um, I think actually everything else doesn't. I don't think anything else changes. So why don't you try that? And the point of, point of this exercise essentially is to show you now that you've got this little program how powerful it is because by changing one or two lines you can you can evaluate the changes of almost anything. And I should say this, that this is actually, of course, if you think about the meaning of the parameters, um, the gamma represents the probability that you're infected when you encounter an infected individual. Um, now, of course, that might depend, if it was an STD like HIV, it would depend on the viral load in the person that one was having sex with. Uh, if it was, uh, COVID, it would depend on whether the person was wearing a face mask, whether they were coughing, also probably the viral load in their lungs. Um, so this gamma represents a real parameter, which is the, 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 the infectivity of the individual. Sometimes those are things that can be changed. For example, viral load with HIV can be reduced by antiretroviral medication. In the case of COVID, it can be reduced by a face mask or social distancing. Um, and so these are these are our fundamentally controllable parameters. Let me try <coughs> doing this myself. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, does anybody see why that crashed? This is actually something I hadn't done before. What I was originally planning on doing was just displaying the results not on trying to calculate the midpoint. Why did it crash?
if the rate of infection is very, very low, how long does it take to have half the population infected? A very long time. I'm running for 20 days. If I don't get to a half, I didn't check in my index loop. I didn't check that to see they don't have a, an opt out if I wind up running off the end of my array. Uh, so I, I, I basically have a, I don't have any fail safe if I don't, if I, if, 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 the, if my, if my not, if I don't satisfy my criteria. So, um, Basically, there shouldn't be an entry if um, this is a case where a for loop might have been better than a while loop. Um, but essentially, what's happening here is that for small values of of, uh, of gamma, um, I never get there. So if I make gamma a little bit bigger to start with, it's all right. People get something that likes like this. So what happens as gamma increases, the time for the population to get infected goes down. And if I go from a probability per if I have a probability per infection of 0.1, it takes 14 days for half my people to get infected. If I have a probability per contact of 0.8, it only takes two days. Now, in this particular model, everybody still gets infected because there's no concept of recovery or anything else. But, but it does show that the, that the infectivity per encounter makes a big difference in the time to which people get infected. So this was the case. This was the time series. Um, let me put back my. Uh, well, I don't need to put back. Okay. So there are two ways I could do this. If I change the number of encounters, what matters is the product of the number of encounters and the probability of infection per encounter, which is the beta parameter. Here I've reduced the probability of infection for each encounter for a fixed number of encounters. So here I've assumed that everybody runs into 10 other people per day. And this is the probability of getting infected for each one of those if those people are infected. So this uh, changing uh, gamma corresponds to changing the infectivity, for example, by wearing a mask or standing six feet apart. If I do isolation that reduces n. So if I have a gamma of 0.5 and I encounter 10 people, that's equivalent to a gamma of one when I encounter five people. So what matters is the product. And so both, both kinds of uh, constraint are effective. Uh, but they're effective. Of course, they have different costs and benefits. Uh, keeping people from interacting is, is, of course, has its consequences economically and socially. Uh, wearing a mask, some people don't like wearing masks, but wearing a mask is probably less costly uh, than not seeing other people. So that's something to think about. Okay, a couple of comments because we're going to run, we're running out of time. Um, in fact, having done all of this computationally, it's sort of anticlimactic. But in fact, these 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 equations have an analytic solution. We didn't have to do any computer simulations at all. Uh, we can just write down the answer, and the answer looks like uh, if people have done chemistry, this looks like a Michaelis function of an exponential. 
So uh, the number of infected individuals, we'll, we'll switch from uninfected to infected, is the initial number of infected people times E to the beta, that is the number, the probability per encounter, the total number of uh, infectious, the probability of being infected per day times time. And at small times, that's enough. And then it saturates. So in the denominator, I have one plus the same thing minus one. So in the limit, remember I said, look at limits. If I look at small times, e to the n gamma t is small. Uh, there's a t missing here in the denominator. There should be a t. Um, e to the n gamma t is small. So this is basically one in the denominator. And I have just i zero e to the n gamma t. So exponent my number of infections goes up exponentially early on. If n gamma t is large, then one here disappears, minus one here disappears, and I'm left with i zero e to the n gamma t over i zero e to the n gamma t, which is going to give me, sorry, actually I'm, I messed that up. It'll give me one, it'll give me uh, basically a one. Everybody gets infected. And the time scale, I've got to fix that equation because it's got a type one. Um, and it gives me, give me the saturation. And I apologize for the type one. And so uh, one thing you could do if you want to play with these a, a little bit more in a homework assignment uh, would be to uh, check whether this analytic solution agrees with your, with your uh, numerical one. The analytic solution provided I don't have a typo like this one is correct. Um, so we have to, we have, uh, but uh, your numerics could be off by a little bit. And so that gives you a sanity check on you. Okay. So I think that that actually is probably not a bad place to stop. Uh, next time uh, we're gonna talk about SIR models. Um, SIR models are going to be including the fact that for many diseases, uh, you recover, you don't hold the disease and you suffer for life. And these SIR models specifically are going to assume that once you recovered, you're not going to get infected again. So that uh, is where I wanted to stop for today. I hope people can download the code they've written uh, and we'll have this available for people to use. Uh, because um, this is something which we're going to we're going to use the same kind of analysis again and again. Uh, so I'll, with that, I'll open it up for questions. Are there any comments or questions people have uh, before we break? I hope people don't mind that we're ending five minutes early. Is that all right? Yes. <laughs> okay. People hungry? I, I'm reasonably hungry. I forgot to eat today. Uh, I started at eight o'clock this morning. So, so not that a 12 hour day should be that long, but uh, did that, did that work for people? I don't know. I know, I know trying to do exercises on the computer in, in sync with things can sometimes be frustrating. It can either be too slow or too fast. Um, on, on the other hand, three hours of straight lecture can be pretty boring too. So is this, is this is this sort of structure for a class okay for people? I can I can add more exam I can add more exercises or fewer depending on what people want. Uh, so you have to tell me what works. And if you don't want to say it out loud, that's okay. You can email me. Um, but this was more or less the rhythm I was thinking of for the class. Um, once we once we have once we have. Um, some basic uh, template code uh, and people get a little more familiar with some of these basic uh, NumPy functions, I think it may get easier, but okay. Okay. Hey, Professor, are you posting these uh, slides anywhere? Uh, the slides are up 
uploaded to, they're both, they, they're, they're, the slides are uploaded to Canvas. Thank you. Um, and I, I should also have saved these slides as uh, also in that, that uh, the Google Drive. Okay. Um, they may change slightly because when I, I, I may not do it tonight because I'm tired, but tomorrow the first <laughs> thing I will do is go through and catch the typos and fix the typos. So you'll often see there'll be a slide deck which will say uh, lecture two or something like that. And then at some point later, there'll be something which will say as given, which is actually not quite as given, but is corrected, which is a deck, which is, is this deck uh, with, uh, with uh, I hope the, the, uh, the errors that I've caught fixed. So for example, that, that, that function that was yeah. typed wrong. Are you, are you posting those in like the file section of Canvas or? Yes, in the file section of Canvas. Okay, can anybody, I can't see, like I don't have a, a link to the file section on the Canvas page. I don't no, know. I also don't have files on here, but um, if you put it, if you put it on the Google Drive, I can find it really easily. Okay, I don't know why. I'm sorry about that. I'm glad you told me. Because the course yeah. is published. So if I Sorry, it might just be that we don't we don't have permissions to the to the files. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, let yeah, me... it's hidden at the moment. Let me see if I can just yeah publish. Let me disable. How do I change it? I'll make sure that it's visible for you. Um, like today. Yeah, my apologies okay. for that one. I I'll, I'll I'll go to Canvas immediately and see if I can see what's going on. Because again, that's the kind of thing where I can't tell until you until you tell me about it. So I'm really glad that you, I apologize, but I'm really glad you told me now rather than <laughs> two months from now. <laughs> yeah, no big deal. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot better that we know now. <laughs> yeah, let me see what the problem is. Files. Fair enough. Why is it not visible? Why? It's published. Disabled, not visible to students. Why? You wonder sometimes if somebody, the person who invented Canvas is a sadist. Uh, student view. No, I agree with that. <laughs> Why? Why would I want to upload files for students and make them not make them visible? <laughs> <laughs> Access denied. What? I changed it. Can somebody check to see if they can see it now? Yeah, yeah, I, I can see it now. Uh, yeah, I can see it. Okay, Josh, where do you go to? Where do you go to unhide that? Uh, you go to settings and then uh, navigation, and then it's gonna show what are the tabs that you want to um, make visible on top, and the, all the ones that are hidden the bottom part. Okay, well, my apologies to everyone. I, I really, uh, I did not mean to wrong foot you on that one. Thank you very much for letting me know. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else before we break? Yeah, no worries. Okay, and how is the homework? I mean, I try, again, you know, sometimes these homeworks can, can be long, but again, if, if it gets long, just tell me it was too long and don't do it. <laughs> it don't. The goal is to is to, to, to give you opportunities to learn how to do things and to I be found, interested. And so if it's too long, you tell me that. I found that it was it was pretty much um, exactly how much time you predicted, about four and a half hours, maybe five or something. It was pretty approachable and until I uh, I think I think parts one and two were pretty good. Uh, and then I 
I hit a brick wall when I got to the SIR modeling. So I had to do a lot of just looking over. Um, I think I solved it halfway through this lecture actually, <laughs> but. Um, so, so that's something that I will do. And I, 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 I should warn you for one thing, the homework, the homeworks, I didn't put up a new homework assignment because I didn't know how far we'd get today. And so I'll try to get that up for you tomorrow. The main homework assignment, which I've given you uh, is, which is up, is that I want you to start thinking about projects now. Because uh, the sooner we get going on that, the better. So I will maybe give a tiny homework assignment, um, a, a sort of a problem like these. But the main homework assignment is to start looking at papers and things that, and just try to come up with an idea of what you might want to do for a project. And I know it's hard until we've gotten further into the course. Uh, but but uh, and I'm but I really would like everybody to have a, at least some idea of something they're interested in by by next week, and then another week or so to get to get uh, a preliminary idea of that, uh, because 16 weeks is not a lot of time to dig into a problem, and so we have to start on that early. Um, so let's focus on that, and there may be one extra problem. But but I was going to say is that a lot of times there'll be homework assignments where either I'll think we'll get further along than we do, and then the homework just doesn't apply because it's not a problem that you didn't you didn't don't know how to solve. But sometimes, like that SIR one, the idea was we're going to be talking about SIR modeling. You know, do a little bit of effort on your own, an hour of effort on your own to play with the idea, learn a little bit, so that way when we cover it in class, it makes some sense. Because sometimes if you play with it a little bit, then it makes more sense why we're doing the things we're doing. <clears throat> but those open-ended ones, because they're open-ended, don't 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 feel that you have to kill the problem. In other words, the idea is to give you an opportunity to, to get a little bit of structure to do some reading and exploration and maybe some little bit of coding, but but not that I'm expecting you to understand everything about SIR models before I cover them in class. It's more, I'd like you to be familiar with the what a, you've maybe heard of an SIR model so that when I mention it in class, you say, oh, that sounds like something I've heard about. Uh, not that I'm expecting you to do everything. So so uh, you're, you're perfectly welcome to come back and say, hey, we didn't cover that. Uh, and then if you feel like learning a little bit, reading a little ahead, that's great. And if not, uh, I understand. Again, uh, there, I grade, we grade the homeworks because my experience is if I don't grade them, people don't do them at all. Uh, but the goal is not to torture you. And if you get, you know, you don't have to get perfect scores on your homework. The point of the homework is to learn. Uh, the grade is the grade is a little bit of a, of a of a nudge, but it's not meant to be punitive. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a problem set ready today because, and it's just as well because because the problem set was mostly about things we didn't cover yet. Uh, so next time we will do S. So next time we really will do SIR models, and by next week Josh will have the fits working, so we will actually be able to fit SIR models to real, uh, in, in, in real data on uh, on uh, on epidemics, and then this won't be just abstract; it'll actually show that we can do something that's useful. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Get some rest, uh, get something to eat. And, and thank you for your patience. Thank you for coming back. And I look forward to working with you next week. And again, if people want to meet with me or talk about ideas and things, um, email me, phone me, and I'll do my best to be available. And I know Josh is also very, very good at this. He's been helping out for several years now. Um, and sometimes... He knows he knows more about Python and, and Tellurium than I do, uh, and he knows less about SIR modeling in this than I do, and those are both good because it means he can help on the computing side when I get stuck, and he sometimes if if it's new new to, new mathematically or confusing mathematically I may not realize it because I've been teaching it for so many years, and he'll be more sympathetic and understanding. Not sympathetic is the wrong word because I'm not I'm never unsympathetic, uh, but he may he may have more insight into what's confusing than I do, because sometimes if you teach something too too long, it seems obvious, 
and it's never obvious. So you, you, I appreciate your patience with me. If something's not obvious, let me know. Okay, great. I'll see you. Uh, if, if I don't talk to you one-on-one -on -one individually, I'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. Bye. Hey, Josh, how did that go? Well, um, I think, um, yeah, I think uh, it's important to emphasize, emphasize what the values of the parameters are. Um, so they are not just 